Here we go. Well, welcome to Leadership on Stock. It's good to have with us today Mark Sanborn. You may know Mark because of a great best-selling book that he wrote several years ago called The Fred Factor. And I have him with us today because he has a brand new book out. It's called Fred 2.0. Mark, welcome. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the new book? You bet. Well, thanks, Tony. It's great to be on your show. And, you know, Fred 2.0 is a sequel. It's an all-new book. It's not an update or revision, but it's definitely a sequel to The Fred Factor, which came out in 2004. Fred is a real-life postal carrier who still delivers the mail here in Denver, Colorado. I first met him when I moved to Denver almost 25 years ago, and he took a simple job putting mail in a box and made it artistry. Uh, he got to know me as a customer. He, he was able to come up with these creative value ads for how he delivered the mail and made sure that I was uh, going to be less likely to become the victim of a robbery. He just did so many amazing things that I started talking about him in my speeches and seminars. As a result of that, he quickly became uh, one of my most requested topics, and sometimes people would send him gifts or cards, uh, care of my address. So I, I wrote a book about the principles that I believe exemplify the great job Fred does of turning the ordinary into the extraordinary. And that was the book that became The Fred Factor. So you're saying this is not a refresh of that uh, book. It's a, it's a fresh new book, new principles. What are we talking about? Well, you know, over the intervening years, people have consistently asked me two questions. Number one, whatever happened to Fred? You know, what's he doing? Is he still delivering the mail? And in addition, I, with his permission, wanted to not only update people about Fred, but, but go a little deeper to add a little more context to the story, why he is the way he is, what he really believes. But the second question people kept asking is, you know, how do we sustain this? How do we keep it going? You know, we've tried everything in the book and we believe in the philosophy, but are there any new ideas you can bring us? So I set out to write a book that would go wider and deeper and not just rehash, but rather build on the principles of the first book. There were four principles in the first book, and this book's about half again longer than the first book. And we get into a lot of new stuff that's been based on both the stories I've observed and collected uh, over the last eight years, as well as uh, a lot of new ideas that I've been able to develop with clients about how to implement the Fred Factor at work. So what uh, part of the core of this is just helping people understand the value of delivering a remarkable service. And so for the, the Freds that are out there everywhere, how, how do you help people understand how they can deliver that same remarkable service no matter what job they have? Well, I know that many of the people that are, are listening or watching uh, are involved in ministry. They're church leaders of, of some sort. And one of the things I always share with leaders, and it's in the new book, is that the first job of leadership is to prove significance to others. Uh, that is to make sure that leaders know that they have to be able to take whatever job is being done in the church and the organization and show that person how what they do and how they do it has a very tangible effect or result or payoff. Because there, I've always said that people that don't feel significant rarely make significant contributions. You know, the extraordinary doesn't happen accidentally. So the, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to create an awareness among the people that we lead about their opportunity to make a bigger, bolder, positive difference, as well as make sure they know how to do it. One of the things I'm, I'm fond of saying is, is that expectation without education equals frustration. Uh, if you expect somebody to add value to their job, build better relationships, any of that, but you haven't taught them how to do it, you're setting yourself up for disappointment and you're going to uh, irritate them by asking them to do something they're not prepared to do. Hmm. Mark, ironically, I have a personal story very similar to your story of Fred. Uh, my father-in-law a couple years ago was diagnosed with leukemia, and he passed away almost a year ago. Uh, it was uh, his postman, though, David, who first uh, was the first person outside of our family that found out that my father-in-law had had leukemia. And the reason why is he was delivering the mail, of course, every day and noticed at one point point over a few days, a number of cards started to come in from all over the country 
And David uh, caught my father-in-law in the driveway one day and said, Mac, something's up. Uh, what, what's happening? Because I see all this mail uh, coming to your house. And uh, Mac, Mac, my father-in-law, kind of shared the beginning of the story. And David, the postman, stepped out of his truck. Turned, he turned off the truck, stepped out of the truck. Uh, put his arm around my father-in-law and prayed for him. And it was just one of those instances, again, similar to what, you're, what you described in your relationship with Fred, where someone took the time to do something highly unusual for a postman, but that relationship that started as a result of that uh, exchange in that driveway made such an impact on my father-in-law. Now, in, in your book, you talk about this key of building relationships. And that that is, is, again, a kind of a core piece of what it is that to have these remarkable experiences. How, how does that play out for leaders in particular? Well, yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your father-in-law. That, that's tough, but it reminds me of a couple of things. You know, in the new book, I talk about uh, a guy named Brother Love. That's what he goes by, but his name is Michael Flowers in Covina, California. Much like the uh, postal carrier that you described uh, that delivered mail for, for your father-in-law, um, Brother Love, it delivers mail for people that have got to love him so much that he's actually sung at several funerals. I mean, he's considered kind of an extended part of the family. And what's interesting to me is, is in the new book, in the first book, I talked about the seven B's of relationship building, kind of the, uh, you know, uh, undergraduate course. In the new book, I talk about deepening connections, and I, I use five words that you'll rarely see in a business book and you really don't hear mentioned in business school. And one of those five words is compassion. You know, compassion seems a little, a little soft and a little dangerous in secular corporate America, but, but we all know that what, what happened with uh, your, your father-in-law's postal carrier is, is that he showed some compassion. Mm -hmm. And he realized, and I think this is a, a philosophical and a practical consideration, that uh, his job wasn't to put mail in a box. Putting mail in a box was one way he fulfilled his job, but his job was to be of larger service to others. And like Fred the Postman, his real name is Fred Shea, uh, he was able to expand the value he created by not being fixated on the, you know, uh, putting, uh, you know, mail in a box as his role. I, I was um, I was told a story about uh, a uh, a woman who hands out bulletins at a church, and she is beloved by everyone because of this simple job that she does uh, with such enthusiasm. But but on top of that, she's blind. You know, she she can't see, and yet. She has uh, been able to find a way to lift people's spirits. Uh, getting a bulletin at my church by and of itself isn't a big deal, but it's how you get it, who gives it to you, and the, and the kind words they bring when they do. So that's what the connection and relationship building is all about. By the way, those other four words, just for your listeners, I talk about redemption, grace, mercy, um, compassion, and uh, redemption, grace, oh, love. I could have, and the reason, it's so funny, I forget love, because in my first book, my editor made me take the word love out nine times. He said, you know, love freaks out business people, so we had to use generosity of spirit. So if you have a <laughs> red factor and you come to generosity of spirit, you know, cross it out and write in the word love, because that's the way I wrote That's great. Well, tell me, uh, at, when, when you talk with people, I've, I've heard you share frustration when you hear – People say, I used to, talking about something that they used to be engaged in that they love to do, and for whatever reason, they're not at that place anymore. Can you give some encouragement to people that kind of look at their past as, as there was something great there that they experienced, but they're not there today? How can you help them kind of re-engage and re-experience um, those opportunities? Well, yeah, I, I've heard that a, a definition that's helped me a lot, that a cynic is uh, simply an idealist that doesn't want to be disappointed again. And I hope that's true, because I, I do have a difficult time, as I'm sure pastors and church leaders do with the cynics. However, if you look at them as someone that maybe was once idealistic or who, who really was not cynical but became very hurt or disappointed, it, it gives you a little bit more compassion and it opens a door on the fact that as a person of faith, we have uh, a safety net that most people in corporate America don't. Most people who used to be Fred-like in their behavior, as I call it in the book, uh, who, who have told me they used to be that way, but they're not anymore, feel they were taken advantage of, they weren't appreciated, they weren't recognized. Now, the first lesson for any leader is, is make sure that you pay attention to the good work people on your team are doing. 
You know, there, there's no excuse for not appreciating people who deserve appreciation. But the bigger message for the Fred or the person doing the work is, is if you do it because you know it's the right thing to do, and, and you do it, as the Bible says, unto the Lord, then getting or not getting appreciation is secondary. You know, that isn't the primary motive. And if, if it is the primary motive, then eventually you get discouraged because we live in a fallen world. You know, this isn't a perfect, you know, accounting of always being noticed and, and having people grateful for the good things you do. So what I tell people is I say, you know, if, if you quit doing it because the reason you did it was for recognition and appreciation, and when you weren't getting it, you had no reason to do it, I get that. But if you did it because it's your nature and, and it's your passion and you believe you're called to do it and that it honors God, then you don't have a reason to say, I used to. And, and I guess the encouragement comes at looking at higher motives other than the, the, the transactional give to get. Because if you do that, you will eventually be disappointed. That's great. Mark, I want to ask you one last question. We're trying to help leaders get unstuck. And so can you think back to a time in your leadership where you felt like you were stuck? And what were some of those steps that you took to get to a place uh, where you were able to go to the next level in your leadership? Well, there have been times that um, I've gotten in this spot on and off over 25 years uh, of being involved in leadership development and as, and as a practitioner of leadership and, and the times that are, are most vivid to me are the times where I faced the three most hated words in leadership, because I believe the three most hated words in leadership are, I don't know. Hmm. See, it, we all believe in my life scriptures, Romans 8, 28. And I think part of the reason I use that as my life scripture is to remind myself how easy it is to use that when things are going well. But when things are going rotten, uh, I, I sometimes have a tendency to abandon my own life scripture because I always try to outthink the problem. I think that's natural. You know, I think God does call us to take responsibility, to be co-creators. But when we can't outthink it and we can't come up with a solution, when we don't have three or four steps, what do you do then? Well, you have to admit, I don't know. And we hate that as leaders. You know, it's one thing if I, if I know, even if I don't, like what I know, at least there's that certainty of I framed it up. When I don't know, there's, there's no certainty, no framing. In times like that, there's basically two things. Uh, one, one is practical and one is, is theological or philosophical. The, the theological or philosophical is, is it really tests what I consider one of the irreducible minimums of the faith. And that is, do we really believe God is in control and that he is sovereign? We can believe it and not feel it. And I think the real challenge is, is, is to try to bring that belief together with how we feel, to make it a part of our, our, our chemistry instead of an abstract, I mean, I can say it, but deep down inside I'm human, right? Or I'm, I'm angry or I'm hurt. So first, it, it is a test when we don't know. Uh, I think as an aside, it's important to realize that when you don't know, uh, all that means is you don't know. It doesn't mean you're bad, good, less gifted, more gifted. It's just an admission of honesty. But the second thing I think we do when we don't know, again, we wait upon the Lord, meaning we're waiting for insight, for answers. But I don't, mean, I don't think that means we just like sit in our, our recliner and wait. I think that, uh, as I define it, hope is having something new to try and being willing to try it. And I went through a process with a buddy not that long ago where he and I were bumping up against a similar problem, different businesses, similar problem. And we'd get together, and at the end, no matter how frustrated or, or how little lack of progress we'd seen, we'd always say, I only know this much. I'm going to keep doing something, and eventually something's going to work. Mm -hmm. Simplistic as that sounds, it's true. It's when you get so discouraged that you no longer look for new ideas or you don't have the energy to apply them that you go from hopeful to hopeless. So I think we have to, be, we have to maintain this tension between knowing we're not completely in control and we won't always know. But that doesn't mean we can't keep trying and reinventing and, and running the flag of a different pole until something makes an impact and a difference. Well, Mark, we really do appreciate that encouragement. And I'm excited for you and for your new, uh, new book, Fred 2.0. Uh, I'm assuming folks can find that in bookstores just about anywhere, right, Mark? Well, we hope so. And if they want more information, they can go to fred2book.com, fred2book.com. There's some free resources and a trailer. Uh, it's been gratifying. A lot of pastors over the years have pinged me that they've been teaching uh, small groups around the Fred Factor uh, philosophies. And I'm a person of faith, and, and there is a Christian version of the Fred Factor published by Waterbrook Press. So 
Tyndale did Fred 2.0, Waterbrook Press did uh, the Fred Factor. So if I can be a resource, uh, I hope you and your listeners let me know. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tony.